We've come to what you can say is Act 2. Right? Act 1, you're building up the character, who this Jesus is, he's showing himself. And Act 2 is when this Jesus is finally fully revealed and what his destiny is. And of course, the disciples are trying to wrestle with it. And in that part, an important story happens, which we call the transfiguration. So that's Matthew chapter 17, from verse 1 through 8. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, and Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Well, Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter must have felt really, really lucky that morning. I mean, first of all, he got to be one of the 12 of this up-and-coming rabbi Jesus. I mean, there were a lot of other young Jewish teenagers like him who tiptoed and stretched out their hands and said, pick me, but they didn't get picked. Peter got picked. The 12. And of the 12, he was the inner, inner circle, the three. These three, him, James and John, and, and they were, uh, had access, the inner, inner access to Jesus. Some miracles that the other 12 didn't even see, like raising the little young girl from the dead. Wow. And then that morning, Jesus says, you three, Peter, James, and John, you come up with me up the mountain. And I think Peter felt really good. He looked around the rest of the 12. You ain't going where I'm going. He must have been excited. He's going to go up there. It's just going to be him and Jesus. Take some selfies. I posted to Facebook. Hey, guys, all the things that you're not experiencing, but I'm experiencing, envy me in your distance. I'm sure he got really, really excited. And when he went up there, he got even more than he expected. He got even more than he expected. Now, Jesus was constantly... Uh, upstaging his own self. Like, you think, wow, that's amazing. And then the next day, he does something even more amazing. And he does miracles, and he walks on water. He tells the waves, like there were little kids, and says, stop. And they're, like, listening, obedient kids, they just stop. Feeds 5,000. Amazing. And now, up on the mountain, Peter, James, and John, Peter's there, and he knows something special is going to be, but this, he never expected this. Jesus' face shone like the sun. Mark says his clothes was bleached like no other clothes was be, is able to be bleached. And then there with Jesus is Elijah and Moses. Wow. They're the heroes, the hall of famers. It, it's kind of like if you are a lover of philosophy, like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all in the same room. That's exciting, isn't it? For some. <laughs> Or, let's say, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and LeBron James at the prime, the same team right there. That's exciting to some of you. <laughs> it's like the, the best. There's Moses and Elijah. So not just Jesus shining his holy glory, but those are the heroes that he grew up with. He said, oh, man, it would be nice if I'd been with Moses. I'd be nice if I'd been with Elijah. And there they are, three of them. This is amazing. 
is so powerful of an event that Peter tells this story over and over again. And obviously this is why gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has this story. Because Peter is always telling about this. Because, hey, you got to have this story. It's an important story. It's something that was totally unexpected. And I saw a, a newer picture of Jesus, who Jesus is. And he tells him. In fact, he even tells the story again in his letter too. Hey, anytime he's writing. Right? It's one of those most vivid, most powerful experiences he had, so he's telling it. But it's interesting the way he tells this story in his letter. What sticks with him, this amazing experience, what is the, the, the detail that sticks with him most powerfully? Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. For we were not making up clever stories, when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So I'm sure like in any experience, when we tell over and over again, there are details that we leave out. Of course, we can't all, don't always say the same thing. But there's always a detail that we never leave out because we know that, that is the essence of the experience. And what's the detail that Peter doesn't leave out of here? Moses and Elijah, right? Because, hey, no one else has seen Moses and Elijah like he did. People have seen Jesus, but Moses and Elijah dead or maybe somehow sent up to God's glory. But he saw it. That's unique. That's special, right? In this letter, in this retelling, what's a detail that he doesn't fail to tell? What God said to Jesus. It's the words. It's just words. This is my beloved son, and he gives me such great joy. In one sense, it is not miraculous at all. It's just words, human words. Human words identifying a deepening of relationship, something that we all long to hear, something maybe Peter would have loved to hear from his dad. It's not about the sudden appearance and the sudden disappearance of Moses and Elijah. It's not even about the sun shining face, but it's these words that is most essential to his experience. So today I want to share with you about these words. I want to consider these words. Why this is so important. And, and I pray that these words will be lodged deep into our hearts this morning. The first point is this. It's because of these words that I trust this story. That this is not a cleverly made up story. That it really happened. Because you see, these words is the most unexpected word from the lips of God at that moment. It, it, it's, it's not something that they could have come up with. That a God who created all the universe would make such a complete, utter confession of love and affirmation. There was no precedence. You know, he... He knows that God is loving, but in the Old Testament, God is also a God of judgment. He judges. And gosh, when, when people don't listen, he'll bring out the rod. Uh, Moses, Noah, the, the Noah's flooding, the ten plagues. And even as Moses was leading the people, when they sinned against God, the Levites went and they speared the people who compromised. And this God, who will judge for the sake of holiness, would say something so completely and utterly affirming and loving and so vulnerable, isn't it? There's no moment when you are more vulnerable than when you make a confession of love, isn't it? When you say to the person, I love you with all of my heart, that basically means now you could destroy it if you want to. The Almighty in such a Oh, it's such a vulnerable confession. Oh, this is my son. 
He brings me such joy. There's no precedence. You, you look at other pagan gods, right? Where there is a family where a god really has a kid, a child, and it's always dysfunctional family. Like Kronos, what does he do with the kids? He eats them, right? Because like, he feels that the kids is going to threaten his life. Zeus, he's like the most absentee father in the world. He fathers all these people and doesn't even know their names. Like, who is that guy? Oh, that's Hercules. Wow, he's so strong. How, why does Hera hate him? Well, because you had him with another woman. <laughs> oh, okay, he's my son. Then let's help him out a little. In that type of story where gods don't really care for their own children, even threatened by their own children, where does Peter get this? Unless it happened. It surprised him more than the Moses and Elijah. Because if you are making this story up, right? I mean, this bringing up Moses and Elijah and all that stuff, that, that fits so perfectly into a good story. Because this is at the point where, remember, Jesus begins to tell the disciples that I am going to die. And so now they begin to question understanding a Messiah. He's going to die. How are they going to bring it together? And so they needed some revealing. And in that sense, this story makes perfect sense. And, and of course, how would you show that this Jesus is the Messiah more better than bringing Moses who said, Someone who, God will send you someone who will be like me, but even greater. And Elijah, who's supposed to precede the Messiah. This is a way to truly affirm that this is it. This is it. This Jesus is the Messiah. So keep listening to him. Even if you don't understand about dying and suffering, keep listening to him. And so those part, when you just listen on its own, it's like, okay, it, it makes sense. It, you know what? This is how I will tell the story. You know, you're... And I all have this intuitive sense of how a story should go. Uh, we were watching uh, Lord of the Rings, and my son Ian said, you know, in every hero story, there's always a mentor. There's always a mentor, right? So they, you, for example, you have what well, Harry Potter has, Dumbledore, right? And Luke Skywalker had Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Frodo had Gandalf. It's like, they all have mentors. So it's like, man, yeah, you're right, you're you're pretty brilliant. Your dad must be really smart. Right? And they all die. <laughs> You're right. They all die. The mentors have to die at some point for the hero to rise up. And they're all white and have beards. You're right. <laughs> they got to have beards. <laughs> right? There's a pattern to it. And in one sense, okay, Moses and Elijah, there's a pattern to it, of course. There's the water baptism, there's a desert temptation, there's a mountain. It's all part of this story, this pattern that all heroes are Moses, Red Sea, mountain, and the desert. Elijah, right? Desert, no rain, praise, rain, baptism, water, goes up the mountain when he realizes that even that's not going to change the king's heart. So there's always this thing, so it all makes sense. And if you had only that, then yes, it's all made up, and it's a great hero story. But all out of nowhere, God, the Creator, says, This is my Son, whom I love and who brings me great joy. So Peter says, I'm not making this up. I mean, this surprised me. What? What? That God would say such an utter confession of love in such a vulnerable way. Second thing is this. Even though it's that words that makes us believe that this event happened, we still don't believe those words to be true. Most of us struggle with it. Tertullian was a pagan lawyer and he became a Christian. And one of the reasons he said he became Christian was because the doctrine of Trinity. Why? Because that makes no sense and no one will make that up. It's like if you're going to start a religion, then you don't go with, oh, well, then there's one and three and three and one. You get it? Like you don't start with that. You want to try to bring in as many people as possible. So you want to be philosophically reasonable and rational. The only reason why anyone would say one God and three person, three person, one God is because they had an experience. They can't deny it. So this is part of what we believe in. So he said, because 
Trinity doesn't make sense, I believe it to be true. And one says here, again, that's what I'm saying, that this, these words from God doesn't make sense, so this event must be true. And yet, those words, the reason why it doesn't make sense to us, still makes us doubt that these words are true, which is that you and I, we live in a broken world, and we have never fully experienced these words ourselves. Oh, I did. When you were two, probably. When we were little, when we were baby, of course, fathers and mothers should shower with kisses and loves and kisses and loves. I love you, my honey, honey, sweet pie, 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 or whatever it is those parents called you guys, right? I love you, I love you, I love you. But did your father ever gather your friends and say to them, this is my girl, this is my son, and it gives me great joy when you are 30, 31, 32, in midst of life and struggling? It's not an experience that we have. And so we doubt whether it's really true that God will say such unconditional affirming love, vulnerable confession. We live in a broken world. We seek this utter affirmation, but what we often experience is judgment. And as we age, we get less and less affirmation and we get more and more judgment. So much so that we reverse the cause and effect. We think that when we're older and we still need affirmation, it's a sign of weakness. Right? To be mature is to be able to live with that affirmation. But that's reversing the cause and effect. We're trying to make a story for the fact that as we grow older, as we struggle, as there are more people whose eyes are on us, that we feel inadequate, unloved, failures. Richard Rohr is a Jesuit priest, and he worked in the, as a prison chaplain for 14 years, and he says this, uh, very rarely will you find someone in prison who had a good father. He says this, and this quote, the rage in the young man who never had a dad or had an alcoholic father, and, and he says woman too, or emotionally unlivable father or his father is bottomless. The rage that a young man or woman has is bottomless when he has absentee, alcoholic, abusive father or mother. And so he realized that after 14 years, his ministry is not just to help the people who are in prison, but help men so that they wouldn't go in prison. And he started this men's retreat where basically is that you are loved. No matter the experience that you had. And it's difficult. It's so difficult. But even our fathers, right, the fathers and mothers who are supposed to give us affirmation, even they struggle with it too. Don't they? Now, I'll be honest. I mean, uh, my father is a good father. I love my father. But I've been judged my father. And I'll be honest. I've judged my children too. I said I won't. I've made a promise. I remember we were in a baseball game. And then uh, one boy just let the, he was playing third base. The ball just rolled under his legs. And his father cried out in front of everybody, what's wrong with you? And, you know, it, I know he didn't mean that what's wrong with your being, but a child doesn't parse all that, right? And I said, wow, I, I, I never want to say that. I never want to say anything like that. But I, I confess, there are these two times those words just came out. And I apologized profusely, but words are like, things that you throw in water, you, you really can't call it back. Words. We've been judged. And we, judge, we judge others. We judge even our own children. That's the world that we live in. And so when we hear this, when we even sing the songs, and what a beautiful, what a wonderful praise. But after the praise, do we still hold on to that? Do we still believe it's true that God to love me in that utter, complete, vulnerable way that God takes delight in my life? 
Do you believe that? In the core of your heart, do you believe that? God takes delight in you. We struggle with it, don't we? We struggle with it. But and here's the third thing. But there's nothing more truer than those words in this life. There's nothing more truer in this world than those words. And God says to you, you are my girl. You are my boy. I love you, and you give me joy. For several reasons. For one thing, it is actually the very reason that you doubt those words is also the evidence that those words are true. See, when we don't receive that full affirmation, when we don't get that from our parents, we, our hearts break, don't they? Or as this Richard Rose said from his experiences, that there's this bottomless rage in us. Now, if we were created to not receive that love, then that lack of love shouldn't break us so much, shouldn't anger us so much, shouldn't hurt us so much, but it does, because it is what we're supposed to receive. Do you understand? Like hunger, right? and C.S. Lewis uses this argument too, right, for another uh, point. When you, the reason you're hungry is because there is something that you are hungry for. There is a real food. Right? So when you get hungry, um, what do you imagine? What foods come up to your mind? Is it a food that you've never eaten? No, right? There's a specific, when you get hungry, there's a specific food that your whole body craves for. Right? It could be a hamburger. It could be some pho noodles, right? Whatever it is, sushi. Or maybe it's like several of the foods just going around and around. But it's a specific food, some food that you've tasted, some food that you know you've eaten, you've experienced, and that's what you hunger for. You don't create something you've never seen. And so for us to long for this affirming love means that there was this affirming, there is this affirming love. The very brokenness of our heart when we don't receive it means there is such perfect love. That even as affirming as our fathers and mothers might be, and yet it doesn't completely fulfill my heart it means there is a perfect love that exists because we hunger for it and wouldn't that be God wouldn't that be God the perfect being and the second reason why we could trust this that this is there's nothing more true than these words is because of the life of Jesus himself in one sense the reason why Jesus comes, right? One of the most important reasons is to show that God is a loving Father. And so, in baptism, He receives those words for people to hear. And so in transfiguration, He receives those words for people to hear. And so when the disciples say, please teach me how to pray. This is how you to talk to your Father. The Father in heaven. He is your Father. And so the whole uh, suffering that he goes through is basically comes down to his relationship with the Father, right? So he goes to Gethsemane and says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. I, want, I don't want to do this. It's hard, but not my will, but yours be done. And at the cross when he dies, right, what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But at the end, at the end with his final spirit, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit to show that life it, it's not easy. It's going to throw you a lot of curveballs. It's going to mess you up at times. It's not going to go your way. It's going to break you. But you, if you trust that God loves you, the Father, God is the Father who loves you, and that will hold you, that will sustain you, even through death. So at the three days after the death, Christ rises from the dead, and it is God's faithful love, the Father, who brings back the Son. 
And so in our creed, when, the, when Christ rises up, we say, He ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. It is all about this intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. And when the Son sits with the Father, it is not so much a display of power, but a display of intimacy restored. He is with the Father now. I'm with the Father. The whole life of Jesus is an evidence that there's no more truer words than the fact that God loves you and me and is delighted in us, even if we're to go through such hellish suffering as the cross and death. This is who you are. You're loved. I want to read this from Henry Nouwen. Um, and a brilliant guy, a professor at Harvard, but gives, it all up, all, gives all of that up to work with less able body. And the quote is in your bulletin, too, because I want you to take it. Um, and he says this, Over the years, I've come to realize that the greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power, but self-rejection. Success, popularity, and power can indeed present a great temptation. But this is the insight. But their seductive quality often comes from the way they are part of the much larger temptation to self-rejection. When we have come to believe in the voices that call us worthless, unlovable, and then success, popularity, and power are easily perceived as attractive solutions. We seek that because of self-rejection. We want to prove, try to prove that we are not to be rejected, that we are worthy of acceptance. The real trap, however, is self-rejection. As soon as someone accuses me or criticizes me, as soon as I am rejected, left alone or abandoned, I find myself thinking, well, that proves once again that I am a nobody. My dark side says, I am no good. I deserve to be pushed aside. Forgotten, rejected, and abandoned. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence. Being the beloved of God constitutes the core truth of your existence and my existence. And the great transfiguration, the great revelation is God saying to the son and to the daughter, to us, through Jesus, you're mine. I love you. And you make me happy. You make me want to make songs and dance. So, application points. How do we practice this? Well, one is this. At this point, just receive that. I know there's going to, it's already in your heart emotionally, and even in your mind, you're already arguing against that. It comes as a theological argument, maybe, but really deep inside is that emotional hurt. How can anybody really love me as like that? But it's not a clever, made up story. It is what Peter heard and what has become his core existence. So receive that. If you close your eyes. Receive these words. You are my beloved. And you bring me great joy. If you could open your eyes. Just receive it, and one of the simple things we can do is we can rest in this every day. Why? Because you will hear the contradictions all throughout your day. You will. And so 
one way to battle the contradiction is to rest in the truth. It could simply be just in the morning, but any time during the day, just sit. God, I am your beloved. I bring you great joy. This is not the self-help thing. I am great. I am successful. No. Of course, you and I are broken up. Our being loved is not conditioned upon being a better Christian, being a holier person. It's not that. You're just recognizing that you're unconditionally, unconditionally accepted. It's not about going to the mirror, trying to rise yourself up. It's admitting that there's nothing you can do to make yourself better. What you can do is just receive who you are. The second thing is this, to affirm this in each other. Quite often, uh, what we come to believe about ourselves is all intermingled with what we believe about the others. When we cannot believe that the other person is loved by God, then it's very difficult for us to believe that I am loved by God. It's it just interconnected. So to affirm that, right? on a daily basis, this core existence. In fact, let's practice that right now. If you could turn to the person next to you and say, you are God's beloved and you bring God great joy. And affirm that in your own relationship too. So, for example, if it's your wife, then say, you are, you are I, you're my wife, my beloved wife, right? And you bring me joy. My child, you are my beloved child, and you bring me joy. Express that. You bring me joy. Let God, the Almighty, the All-Vulnerable, be the example for you. If God can say that, if God can say that, then we can say that. Don't be afraid of, well, if I say you bring me great joy, then he'll think that he's all perfect and everything, and now he's not going to even try. Well, why do you even think like that? Why do you even think like that? God speaks to us in the midst of our brokenness, so say that to your child, to your spouse, to your friends. You bring me joy. I am so happy that you are in my life. I close with this story. This past week, um, I went to uh, Deepak, the theater, um, and it was a concert held by Reality Ministries by Susan McSwain, a good friend of mine. And it's Reality Ministries, basically ministry to less able people. Right? And, and so uh, not to push them aside, but to create a community with them. And so it's not just serving them, but they realize that in living with them that they all get, always also get blessed. And in this concert, it was these less able people, right? In the, in the stage of Deepak, right, with all the lightings and the sound, and they were just putting on a show, and, and they did dances like Thriller, right? They did songs, they did praises, they did skit, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and they all did it. And it was all, as far as the my societal ideal, of course, it's not something that you pay a ticket for, but it really moved my heart and my children's heart. At, at, at the end of it, the end of the, uh, the last show was uh, Beauty and the Beast, and this person who comes out, right, and he's being the beast, and he has a beast mask uh, on and suit on, and, and actually he's like two measures earlier than the song, so he's singing the, the chorus melodies while the soundtrack is actually the first melody, so it's off key. And then that point where the the uh, beauty comes, and then they kiss, and he goes full gusto, and he changes, and he takes out his mask, right? and here it is, the handsome prince, and he presents himself to the stage as if he nailed the whole thing. And he did. And we clapped. And Dylan, as we were walking out, we were walking out, these are words that my kids said. Dylan was like, can we come back here tomorrow, see the show again? And Ian said, this is the best musical. And Ian says, and Ian is the most, I think, empathetic. I was crying. <laughs> and even that night as I was laying Dylan down to sleep, right, Dylan was saying to me, this was the best night ever. It wasn't Hamilton, 
But it was great. Because what they saw was this. Not, not so much pity on the less able people. Right? Or not even, and this is what I thought, that less able people, they just a mental challenge so they don't know that they get judged. But it, I realized that's not it. Actually, less able people already accepted that they're limited. That here I am. This is who I am. I can't do anything to make myself better or more worthy. This is who I am. And God has accepted me as I am. And so it's not so much that they're not unable to accept the judgment, but they've already accepted that they're accepted. And so the joy just comes out. That's when I realized that night, what Susan McSwain shared with many of our micro we say, you know, when I work with the less able people, they bless me because they show me what God's love is. And one sense, we're all less abled, right? We all cannot do what we want to do. We are all limited. But that's okay. Because God the Father broke through the heavens and said to you, you are my beloved you bring me great joy. Let's pray.